mentioned to me and Owen with us and train, and they're going to do a presentation before we get our meeting started if you want to. Okay. So okay. just come on. And... I'm Nancy McBee with Train, and this is Owen the Water with Train. Uh, back several months ago, I met with Mr. Hall and with Mr. Blakely, and uh, for the purpose of looking into your utility costs. Uh, we do projects. We're, we're with TRAIN, but we're with the Energy Services Division of TRAIN. And we do energy conservation projects uh, for a whole lot of school systems in, uh, in Tennessee. And the first step in determining if uh, you're a candidate for an energy project is to analyze your utility data. So Mr. Blakely set us up with uh, all of your utility providers, electricity, gas, water, <coughs> Um, anything that is considered utilities, we gathered that utility information. I've got this handout. I don't know if you've had a chance to look through it. There's a, basically there's a cover letter that summarizes uh, sort of what we've done, we've done so far. And, and as I said, it's basically a utility analysis and where we benchmark you versus other K-12 school systems in the TVA region to see where you stand versus where you should be. Um, if you read through this letter, uh, in our analysis, <clears throat> we've identified that you all are spending about $230,000 more a year in your utility costs than you could be or that you should be. And that's money that can be reallocated and redirected into things that would upgrade the school system to save you the energy, to save you that $230,000 uh, per year. If you, if you take that money over a at the $230,000 a year over a 12 to 15 year term, that would fund up to $2.6 million in infrastructure upgrades. <coughs> and the th types of upgrades that would uh, create these savings would be LED lighting, as I was talking to Mr. Blake early, earlier, uh, control systems, heating and air conditioning replacements, uh, weatherization. Uh, down in Campbell County, part of the project we did there actually included replacing CRT computer screens with LCD computer screens. And it paid for itself through the savings that it generated. But for kicks and giggles, I'll sort of take you through the presentation that we have put together. Um, these types of projects are considered performance contracting. And there's a definition here by the United States Department of Energy. Basically, it's guaranteed, it's the use of guaranteed savings from your maintenance budget, from your utility costs used as capital to make upgrades in the facilities and with the, with, the, with the savings being guaranteed. So if Train was to say you're going to save $230,000 per year and you just save $200,000, Train actually would issue a check for the $30,000 difference. So it's, uh, it eliminates your risk. Um, well, there's a few slides I'll just skip over here. <coughs> Now, where do these savings come from? They come from, and I'm looking at this slide, from electricity costs, water costs, maintenance costs, and gas costs. And when you put all those savings together, that's what funds the project, along with you know, potential TVA incentives for upgrading your lighting and HVAC. <clears throat> it's basically uh, no new money. If you're looking at your existing utility budget, you keep that, you just reallocate your excess, the excess utility expenditures into the upgrades. So like from a county commission standpoint, you're, you're not asking for new taxes, you're just reallocating money that's already in your budget that you're overspending on utilities. Um, our whole goal is a self-funding project. We have a series of audits. Uh, the first audit was this utility analysis that we just completed. Uh, the whole goal is to put together a project that pays for itself over the term. Let's see. Uh, the things that we look at, I mentioned before, uh, heating and air conditioning equipment, lighting, plumbing, uh, building automation systems, controls, so that you can control mm -hmm. your buildings better, uh, computing and communication technology, uh, you can see there's a whole list there of things that we, when we get into this, the next step in a project like this, these are the things that we actually dig in and get in all the schools. From a high level, from this bar chart, from a high level, uh, Scott County Schools, you all are currently operating at about $1.76 a square foot in your total utility costs. And that's versus a target 
uh, train has a target for this school system at a dollar twenty-five. So basically, for every square foot, uh, there we we foresee about fifty-one cents uh, of savings for every square foot, which equates to two hundred thirty thousand dollars a year in savings. The next page shows a breakdown of all of your schools. The green line shows what our target is, so you can see who your your biggest offenders are and where the where your least expensive to operate facilities are. You know, for instance, uh, you know, Board of Education is up at three dollars and forty two cents a square foot. Some of that, you know, may not be totally accurate once we dig into it. Uh, but you know, Winfield Elementary is at two dollars and yeah, 244 a square foot, which is pretty high. So some of these are, are higher than the others. If you take that uh, the $230,000 a year in savings, uh, those savings would fund $2.6 million in real property upgrades and financed over a, and the, the example we put together is a 15 year term at 3% interest. Uh, and currently, uh, some of you guys that were at the TSBA in Nashville recently may have encountered uh, Paul Frost and Scott Slusher there with the Energy Efficient Schools Initiative. Uh, the Energy Efficient Schools Initiative has grants and low interest loans for K-12 school systems in the state to do projects just like this. Uh, and currently they've got 1% interest loans for K-12 school systems to do these type of upgrades. And when the Energy Efficient Schools Initiative is in, when they're involved, their engineers are involved, they oversee everything, um, you know, they would be involved with the, the whole project if you, if you pursue something like this. <coughs> on our, the way we do these projects on this next little flow chart, we basically come in and introduce the concept of performance contracting, which we did with Mr. Hall and with, with Mr. Blakely and we do a feasibility study, and that's all we've done so far is a feasibility study. Uh, the next step in our process is a preliminary audit, and that's where we actually come out with our engineers and project developers and we go through each and every one of your schools, and when we come back with a list of each school with everything we see as potential energy conservation measures, you know, from uh, LED lighting, HVAC upgrades, every school would look different based on, you know, what the needs are at that school. Uh, you'll see there's no financial commitment by the school system for us to come in and do that preliminary audit that comes back with so much, it comes back with a ton of information to help you make a decision about whether you want to move to the next step or not. But again, there's no financial commitment until we finish that preliminary, that preliminary proposal. Uh, the last slide, <clears throat> uh, Basically, first step, second step, and third step. The first step we've completed, which is a feasibility analysis. And the second step would be a letter to proceed. Uh, there's a copy of the letter to proceed in the back of this uh, document. And you'll see, basically, it's a letter to, from the school system to train, saying we're authorizing you to dig into our facilities, see what all, you know, where are we wasting the energy. Uh, we're not committed to anything financially. And we're going to come back and provide a... Uh, an assessment of what we've got. And the biggest commitment by the school system would be time on, I guess, Mr. Blakely's part or people who report to Mr. Blakely for, for his maintenance staff to meet with our project developers and engineers to walk the schools and assess what all you've got out there. Uh, and I think that's pretty much everything that's in here except for questions. And I'll ask Owen if he wants to add anything. I think you did great. Okay. I mean, that's pretty much how these projects work. Um, and as I said, you know, we are with TRAIN, but we're with TRAIN's Energy Services Group. And uh, we do projects like this all over Tennessee. And in East Tennessee, a lot of your neighbors, I mentioned Campbell County. We were at Campbell County today where we did an energy upgrade project about six years ago, and I believe their savings are maybe $350,000 a year that we're guaranteeing, and they are actually exceeding their guarantee by seventy dollars to $90,000 every year. You know, I would urge you to call Mr. Nidefer or some of the people within Campbell County to ask them how this project has gone, because it's gone really well. It's gone so well that they're having us come back and because of advances in technology and LED lighting being the big one, uh, we're going to go back through 
and replace uh, lighting that was installed six years ago with new state-of-the-art LED lighting and it will pay for itself. So, you know, but we've done projects in Campbell County, Cumberland County, Jefferson <coughs> County, Knox County uh, is, I, I guess Knox County is our biggest customer in the state. We're Knox County Schools uh, Energy Partner where we've done, they didn't, they didn't have us do all 88 schools at once. We did it over, I guess, there were five different phases. Uh, and, you know, I would urge you to call Bob Thomas. Uh, and actually, I think we talked before that Mike Davis, and he's not with Robertson County anymore, but uh, it is Robertson County, isn't Yeah. It? Yeah, so, so <clears throat> excuse me, we have, we have another team that we're actually in the process of doing the same type of project with Robertson County that Director Davis got us started on, and then, of course, he retires halfway through, so <laughs> yeah. we're looking for him. <laughs> we have numerous references, and uh, we do a really good job, and we'd love to be able to, we'd love to be considered to do a, a preliminary audit on your schools and dig in and see how we could save you, how we could actually save you that $230,000 a year. And I would love if y'all had some questions. Well, we're about saving money for sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, my question would be with some of the changes that you would have to do in some of our buildings that are very old. What kind of cost are you looking at to make these changes to be able to save this money? Well, and it would all depend on and on all of you. So, so I mean, you know, that that's by the way, that's the magic question. So, so. You know, right now we just we're just doing early on um, coming at it backwards, so to speak, where we're looking at the utility span and we're benchmarking the school district against other school districts in the state, and we're saying, okay, we ought to be able to reasonably get them to a dollar twenty-five a foot. The the real big question is though, is what is the cost to get in there? Um, we we have some some good. Um, Statistical data and historical data and some industry benchmarks. Um, you know, you can make a pretty good dent with the lighting. Uh, you can make a pretty good dent with plumbing. You can make a pretty good dent with weatherization. Some of the stuff that gets that gets uh, capital intense, like HVAC replacements, roofs, windows, things like that, normal capital improvement items. They won't typically pay for themselves, but they do have a guaranteeable savings associated with it. And so the whole trick is to do the audits so that you can kind of mix and match based on what the specific needs are and get the right balance to where each school is getting something out of the program. I would be interested in seeing maybe, <clears throat> I guess the audit would be, would tell us how much, uh, <clears throat> how many years is it going to take before we start seeing the profit, is basically what I'm interested in. Well, and that, so then that's another. Some folks have us build a program where we maximize what they get from the savings. So, so basically, any savings generated is going to fund the program. So. Like, like, for instance, in the example that Nancy spoke about, $2.6 million worth of improvements. And so let's just say that that was lighting, plumbing, weatherization, and some control systems. And, and let's say it cost $2.6 million. Well, then the annualized savings would create the debt service capacity to pay for that program over time. And so if you did that program and you used the state's money for the 12-year term, Basically, basically, those savings would be committed to that debt service for that term, you know, before you were done. Um, the thing about it, the way to, the way to look at it is, you've got your normal budgeting process. So you budget, you know, you've got your, your normal operating budget, and then you've got your capital improvement. Those things don't change. This just gives you another tool to go get stuff done. And the, the neat trick about this is, and so let me just ask this question. So when you all decided to get on the Board of Education, did any of you realize you were going to become property managers? And, and the trick is, is, you know, you're managing public real estate assets, and so here's a way to demonstrate, you know, good stewardship of taxpayer money where you take utility overspend and use it as a way to get stuff done without going and, and asking for pennies. 
You know, Mr. Blakely made the comment to me, it's sort of a sneaky way to get things upgraded. And it's not sneaky, may not, not be the sneaky, best term, but <laughs> it's, creative. it's a creative sneaky, way to... Sneaky is not really probably the best adjective. It's creative. But, it's but creative. it is a creative way to get some... And, and if you experience the upgrades in, in LED lighting, you know, if you get a, a little older, eyes need a little more light to function yeah. the way they used to. Uh, aren't, aren't we uh, still paying on our other one? We are. Are we done? <coughs> yes, and, that, and that's a good thing to bring up, and I would like Owen to comment yeah. on that. <clears throat> so, so in, incidentally, so like Nancy commented on the Campbell County uh, project that we're into. So that project wrapped up um, you know, right out six years ago, and that's the first question that, that they brought up. They said, well, we just did the lighting, and aren't we still paying on that? Okay, so... Technically, no, because when you arrange for the funding, you, you have to do a depreciation schedule. And so, for instance, like when you all did the lighting here, your lighting is depreciated in the first five years. It's by law. It's, in other words, it's fluorescent lighting. It's got a five-year life. It's got to be depreciated in the bond or loan structure. Okay? So the lighting component was what the early money went to pay off. And then like plumbing components or HVAC components would have a longer lifespan. You have to realize that when we look at your current utility spend today, that takes into account what you already did and what your current debt service is on that. So you're just layering on on top of that, uh, keeping that in account. In other words, what you did before was not a waste. That got you to where you're at now and now you're taking it a step further. The whole trick with these programs, seriously, you, you design the program conservative with, and, and um, I'm looking for a, well, I just, I'll use my term. And you combine it with what we call a no BS guarantee. And the no BS guarantee is that what we do is we set them up at the utility meeting. And that way you take all the guesswork out. In other words, listen, you either saved the money or you didn't. And if you didn't save the money, train writes you a check, they push the button and start the program over for the next year, every year. And that, that type of a program takes the risk off of you. You build a program conservative where you know you have some cush and you, and you do the things that that type of a program would afford you to do. And then you still do your normal budgeting like you're doing today to replace your HVAC units or a new roof or a new window. In a lot of cases, we can include windows, we can include roofs, we can include various things. But until you get into the audits and determine what the costs are, we don't really know what can fit in there. Does that, does that make sense? Oh yeah, I mean, I know where we're going. Right. <coughs> it's kind of taking the money, it's not adding to anything. It's taking the money that we're done budgeted for and paying for this structure to be done to the time, from the time it's basically paid for, then there's another upgrade that's going to have to be kept in place. <laughs> I mean, so, yeah, it'll be faithful to the savings. Exactly. Right. right. And we have to commit to the 2.6 million, is that correct also too? No. no. Okay. No, what, what we typically do, I mean like what we just did with Mr. Nida for today, <clears throat> when we do the audit, there's nothing glorious, it's a spreadsheet, lines and lines and lines, and it basically takes every building and it line out of it out, you know, okay, here was the interior lights, here's the exterior lights, here's the weatherization, here's HVAC unit number 12, here's this, here's that, and it goes on and on and on and on, building by building. And then there's a tool that we use where you can you can select or deselect that line and the whole thing drives a cash flow model so that you can look at it and then you can play around with what funding looks like in a 10 year term, 12 year term. And you don't ever want to put yourself into a scenario where your funding, your, where your financial term outlives the useful life of what you're doing. Um, it's, quite frankly, it's illegal. But I'm sure everyone can relate when I say, you know, if you, if you take a crafty person and you stretch things, you can put people in an uncomfortable space. Well, like in our case, 
we're not going to do that. You know, we live in Knoxville. I've been a train I'm in 31 years, and I mean, we take a very conservative approach because it's all about who you do business with, you know. And and I'd like to be the one coming back 10 years from now, going, "Hey, it's time to do it again," and you guys going, "Hey, that was great. You know, we're going to do it again." Yeah, so. and actually to answer your question, like what we sat with Mr. Nottifer and mm -hmm. went through the spreadsheet of schools and, and items, it totaled $5.5 million. But what will pay for itself for them on this second phase is about $1.8 million. Right. So they're not doing all that, but the thing that gave them or is giving them, it's helping them budget for, you know, three years from now, four years from now, they've got HVAC units at Elk Valley or, you know, that helps them plan for what's coming down the road. But they pick and choose what they want and and the cost and savings flow from there. Right. So you're all talking about lighting and air conditioning and control systems, plumbing. Because the really the bottom line is most of this comes down to human involvement if you don't have them on the computer. And that's where everybody's bills goes up the tube. Because people walk out of the room, leave the air conditioners turned down to 70 or 68, and they'll run all night. But I was thinking that some of that we had those things controlled motion off the rooms. Mm -hmm. They kick down our computers, they kick down. Right. So most of your savings and all this stuff will come through the light. controlling them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, having the lights off, you know, turn them off and you leave the room. Because if you don't do that, you know. Right. And, and Mr. Hall, you keep mentioning the lighting. The lighting is, some people got the, the low-hanging fruit. The lighting will help you pay for things that have a longer payback that you really need. Right. Yeah. That, so you're talking about changing HC units and stuff like that? Is yeah, it, potentially. Yeah. You know, depending on what we uncover during the preliminary audit. Yeah. Actually, Nancy... See, those, those in my opinion, I, this is a guess on my part. But it's really hard to overcome something like that if you're taking out units that are working. I mean, you can do these things, but when a unit tears up, then you can. But if you start taking all that stuff out, putting all this new stuff, you can never overcome that. Right, you're right. right. Money-wise, you're, right. you're kidding yourself. You're uh, absolutely right. Especially, I mean, in today's uh, time, Trying to replace an air conditioning unit for energy savings doesn't make financial sense. Now, if you run the clock back about 20 years, you could make it work because of the advances in technology. But today, um, for instance, you could imagine, you know, we work for train. I get all kind of people call me all the time. Hey, oh, and I, I got to change the air conditioning unit at my house. You know, what should I do? The well, first question is, well, how long do you intend to be in the house? Because, you know, you can buy air conditioning units today with zero ratings in the 20s. But if you ever go to price that up, you could also buy a new Cadillac for what that air conditioner is going to cost, and you'll never see the savings. <coughs> sure, you'll have a lower light bill, but it will never overcome what the cost is, you know. So what we try to do is we try to use what's called remaining useful life. So, you know... You know, there's industry data, and just because something is old doesn't mean it needs to be replaced. You walk up on an air conditioning unit, it could be 15 years old, and the ASHRAE statistics say, hey, that unit has reached the end of its useful life. But if the unit's been maintained and it's running and it's in good condition, you know, a professional can look at it and say, that unit's easily got five more years. You know, and so that kind of data goes into the audit, and that way, when you're sitting there looking at all those lines of data, we've got some additional information that we can say, well, yeah, that's on the list, but that's probably five years out, so I wouldn't make that one a priority. That kind of information. Does anybody else have any questions? We thank you for coming. Well, thank you and for having we'll be us. Back in touch. Okay. Thank you for having letting us be with you. Thank you for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess we'll get out of your hair. <laughs> well, you're going to stay listen to us if you want to. <laughs>
Um, just to let everybody know, we are still right in the middle of the EOC testing. Uh, we did start that right when we came back from Thanksgiving break, and so we're right in the middle of that. We will continue that through the end of this semester. Um, it is quite lengthy. It is quite involved. Um, we've had good attendance so far, uh, knock on wood. Um, we haven't been hit with too much of the kids that have been out. We've been able to pull them in. Um, for makeups, but we will continue with that EOC testing through the end of this semester. On December the 14th, uh, the Scott High Bluegrass Band has been invited back for a second year to the Blue Plate Special. That's that uh, nationally syndicated radio show um, that they were invited to and went to last year. They were invited back, so they're going to that on December the 14th. They will play sometime around noon. Um, and Mr. Sexton is supposed to send me the um, station and radio link and all that information. He's supposed to send that out to me this week, so I will forward that on to you all. Um, so plan on the 14th to be near a radio um, around noon so you can listen to our kids on there. That'll be really exciting. Um, also, just to kind of let everybody know, uh, because the EOCs will run right up until the end of the semester, uh, we will have about half of our classes that are involved in those that will not be able to completely finalize their grades because the EOC has to count 15% of the student's final grade. Uh, the Department of Education sent out an email last week that said they are expecting those EOC quick scores to be back around January the 5th. So it should be right during that very first week that we come back to school from Christmas. Um, we have a process that we used last year on how to um, temporary, temporarily have grades in for those EOC classes. Um, it will have a note on there that says uh, pending EOC grade that will let parents and students know that those grades are not complete and then we will complete those that week when EOC scores come back. Uh, because of that, we will not uh, print grade cards and mail those home before Christmas break because it's kind of pointless because about half the classes won't have final grades. So what we'll do is we will wait until that very first week we're back from Christmas, finalize those EOC grades, then at that time we will print and mail grade cards. So it'll be about a week behind. But again, we've been through this process a couple of times, so, so we kind of got it down at this point. Uh, but it is just a little bit different, and we'll send out a school reach to remind parents of that. Um, all of those updated grades for those completed classes will be on the Power School app. They will be able to check that in a lot of time. So we'll try to get all of that information out there as we get a little bit closer to the end. And I think that's all that I have, unless you all have any questions for me. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. What are you girls here for? <laughs> I'm here for Miss Stanley. Okay. We'll let you go next. And she's had a couple of reminders. Our Winter Wonderland will be December 15th on um, Friday at 6 o'clock. And Monday, December 18th, we will have a Christmas play. Um, I wrote a grant and received it from the Tennessee Arts Commission. And so the Bright Star Theater Company is going to come perform a Christmas carol for our kids in grades 2nd through 8th. Um, our abbreviated day of the, is, of course, Tuesday. And then she also had a question for me, or for you all. Um, she had a representative from a company come to school asking, asking about the specifics for the field bots and the bleachers in response to a, the bid notice in the newspapers. And she made some phone calls, and she said those had not been written yet. So she wanted me to ask if that was something that she needed to do, or has it since been taken I think that's the way we, we looked at the day on the lights. It needs to be able to go on the size you want and the uh, kind of specifications from there. Okay, awesome. Just let me know. And that's it, unless you have questions. Okay. What time is the play going to be? Uh, um, it's going to be at 9 a.m., so you all are welcome to come and watch that. When we're going to do these lights and these fields, we need to do them individually. You ain't going to believe the difference. An electricity bill is when you wham them lights on. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And then when yeah. you click them on one of the at a time, it's a whole different oh, yeah. ball game. Yes, Mr. Hall and I had a, a pretty good conversation about, about that situation this afternoon. And we have since learned that there are specifications for sports lighting on TWSAA's website. So that's an option. 
I spoke with Mr. Allen Hill and he says one of the better ways is if you can do some sort of lend lease or lease purchase with your local utility. <coughs> so we're exploring that as well. So we, we've got some things going and we're, we're working on it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm here for Fairview. Okay. Uh, we'll be having our first uh, country Christmas event uh, next Thursday, December the 14th at 5 p.m. Uh, there's going to be a Christmas dinner, a silent auction, fantasy of trees, Santa pictures, vendors fair. Um, and then around 645, our middle school is going to put on a production of a little play called The Only Christmas Pageant in Town. We'd like to invite every one of you all to come see how hard the kids have worked and how great they're doing. We are also currently in the process of completing our STAR benchmark testing, and so far we're already seeing a fair amount of growth uh, from the students um, from August, especially among our intervention kids. And then um, the Monday after, um, on December the 18th, we'll have our White Christmas program. That's where all the uh, each grade level comes in and does a little song, and all the kids bring uh, canned food and to donate to our local food pantry. And then that afternoon, Mission of Hope is coming for us. So, any questions? Right, thank you. Okay, thank you. I guess I guess all the principals done that. Yes. Okay. Linda, do you have anything? <coughs> I just put on your desk up there <coughs> the 10 ready scores, two through eight. They did finally come in online. Um, also downstairs today, uh, I received the two through eight box of reports, written reports. I mean, those were so, came in so much sooner than I ever expected, so that, that was a good thing. Um, but looking at the scores, first of all, let me remind you that grade two, this would be the first, this last year would be the first year they had had the new second grade test. Before they had had a normal reference test, uh, the SAT-10. Last year was the first year they had the criterion reference that accommodated and was similar to what 3 through 8 had. So if you'll just look at that, uh, the grade 2 test will be the baseline scores this year. We can compare those next year, keeping in mind that we can't compare anything with 2 through 8 from last year's scores because we didn't test. Uh, but if you look at these, I do have each school's per grade their scores along with the district and the state. Um, I think our ELA is, is making progress considering the fact that this was a new test, a harder test, we, and we really don't have anything to compare it to necessarily other than the state. Um, you can see, for example, I know Ms. Stanley's not here, but she'd be very proud if you look at Winfield, every single grade exceeded the state scores except sixth grade, I think. So um, that that's really good. And in a lot of a lot of our schools exceeded the state scores. For example, Huntsville Elementary grades uh, second and third did. Robbins grades five and seven did. Birchfield grade seven. Fairview grade three. Um, so that's a good thing. And we do have something to work toward. I guess our area of concern in ELA where we differ the greatest, the district from the state scores would be grade four, fourth grade. So, um, you know, that we're, we're proud of those ELA, ELA scores. We, we could tell improvement there big time. Looking at math, we do have a few more grade levels as far as areas to improve in math, and I will tell you that math test was very hard. A lot of those upper grades especially ran out of time. It was so different. It was not just multiple choice. It was the CRA type, you know, answer the problem, do the steps, why did you do this? Um, so it, it was very difficult, but we did have some areas of concern there, especially I guess the greatest area in math would be fifth grade. We have a few schools who did exceed the state though. Mm -hmm. uh, in grade two, uh, we have four schools that, ex well, actually the county district, three schools county district did exceed the state score mm -hmm. in grade two. We have a few grades in grade three, uh, but basically, if we look at grade five, that's that is the grade that we really need to 
look at and see what's going on there. And still, schools in their specific grade levels, we you know we do plan to look and see those schools that have really much quite a bit higher scores <coughs> than the other schools in those certain grades. Those are areas to look at. What are these teachers doing in order to improve those specific grade levels? Um, if you look at science, we do not have new science standards yet. They will be coming out and will be in effect next year. We're actually sending a team to a meeting in December this month, and teachers will be trained in science on the new standards this summer. And I will tell you, they have changed quite a bit. It's, it's going to be much more difficult. If you look at our comparison to the district, to the state, uh, we do have some schools that really are meeting and exceeding the state level, but yet we do have some areas that we need to, to work on. I guess grade five probably would be the greatest area of concern there. But these are uh, the scores, kind of a summary of scores, and what you saw last time was all we had, and it was like a three through five comparison, and a three through eight comparison, and a six through eight comparison. And this one is by grade. Any questions about that? How long have we had these scores now? We got these last week. Let's see. I actually had fractured my ankle and I was out the third, well, actually the third week of November. So when I came back to work, I came back on Monday. I had already got an email that the scores came in on Monday. So we got these scores on November. Uh, the 20th, because that was my first day, day back and it was so bad I couldn't work the 21st. But on the 20th, they were there and I called each principal and told them how to get into Questar. Because I'm going to tell you, that is not a user-friendly site. To do. It's awful, it is, is it not? Um, but anyway, the principals have, they've printed their scores off. So, uh, so... Not, not very long, and actually I had to take them all home this weekend and different, you know, disaggregate them and do all that. So, but it's amazing that now we have the paper copies this soon, which they can send home to the students. Has those student uh, individual profile reports, along with summaries and stickums and those things. So it's taken the state quite a while to get these to us. I, we we thought, even though they would say, yeah, they're going to be out. Tomorrow or in a few days, we knew it'd be nearly Christmas. So that's kind of sort of in the case. I mean, I guess what I'm asking, are you going to look this over? And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to look down through there and see some major problems. I mean, are you all going to yes. meet with these people and be eyeball to eyeball? We, we do have to. And think because about it, we had this, this at the beginning of the year. I mean, you're, I'm just looking at the first section there in eighth grade at Birchfield, six, mm -hmm. and you got the fourth grade's 19. Yeah, uh, compared to the district, you, even in the state. You, you've yeah. got to be eyeball to eyeball. Even school. when you move down to math, I see Fairview in grade five, they've got a five. I mean, to me, you need to focus on those things first, those hardliners there. Right. The obvious. The obvious. Uh, you got to pick, pick those off and uh, really be just have a set down <laughs> with that. Well, and that's, and the said, said, that's the hard part about getting this type of information in November and December because not only is half of your school year gone, but you've already made those placement decisions. Um, see, used to, under the old TCAP and uh, the old testing model, we would get this information in July late June, July, and we can make those placement decisions and we can have those conversations and, and send people to additional training and, you know, get mentor teachers and all of those things that need to be in place sometimes for the support to see improvement. Now, you're not getting that until after those that time has already passed and you're halfway into the school year, you've already got... Um, your personnel is already there, your curriculum is already in place and halfway over. So that's, she and I have spent a lot of time talking about that is our issue on the state side of that is while if they're going to stick with this type of assessment model, that's fine, but they need to be able to get us the information and the results much quicker 
in order for them to be useful to be to um, and really be effective. Right, and in four months, yeah, well, we I, retest. Yeah. Let's just say they don't do I'm that. retesting right now and <laughs> just got my information. Uh, so. I'm on the outside looking yeah. in. Let's yeah. just say they don't do that quick. Sure. And I'm looking at the fourth grade there. To me, we need to set what we're going to do next year. Fourth grade's going to fill. And it's not like all sure. of a sudden, that's, if that's a weak group, then you know that they're going mean, to be sure. weak next year. So you, mm -hmm. you work on fourth grade, but actually what you're wanting to fix is get your curriculum and everything fixed for fifth grade. Because right. that same crew is going to be there. Sure. So and it would have helped. It, it would help if we get the scores, but let's say if we don't, right. we got to be proactive. And sure, and you can do ahead. it that way, but what it will keep you from doing is making those same year improvements. You're really, you end up with a lag year behind, is oh, what you there's end up no doing. Doubt about but, that. Yeah. And we had no test scores last year no. to compare. Right. So it's we are baseline. trying to figure this out blindly. Mm -hmm as far as making decisions this year. And I will say that there are there were some principals who made a lot of changes yes, as far as teachers in their grade levels. Yeah. And sometimes principals have to make tough decisions and that and might is. need so to happen. Yeah. And I will tell you this, and I know Mr. Hall remembers, back when uh, AYP was yeah. determined by third grade, Basically, what did we do, Mr. Hall? We said but our best we have got grade. to find teachers that will excel in that third grade, and that was when Sweet. we were doing SAT 10 K2. Mm -hmm. And if you will always look at our third grade for the last forever, practically the last five years, six years, well, since then, our third grade scores have been exceptional. Sure. You know, so we are going to have to look at that. It would have helped if we would have had last year's scores to have looked at that in a in a more educated light and made better decisions but yes we are where we are right now and we are going to try to get with our principals and see you know what's going on there my and next question we can do would be a question part. nobody wants to answer but when we go in here and i'm not after any teacher because i know my wife's a teacher it's a hard job it's a 24 7 job but when we work for these teachers a few years and things don't begin to change, I guess my question is, what are we going to do about it? Now, I'm not being mean here. I'm just, my background's business. <laughs> and when I'm running a business, and that's all I've ever done, when I've got employees that just not getting the job done, then I've got to make this decision. Now, I know it's never fun, especially in an area where you know everybody. Oh, yeah. But I'm telling you. How do you make it you can't just be shifting teachers around if they're not good here. A lot of times they're not going to be good over here. And we're group. Yeah. I'm not being mean. No. I'm uh, just, I've uh, been in that position before and had to do that before. It's not easy. One, I've done it multiple times. It's not easy decision to make. Um, for anybody, it's not a comfortable situation. Sometimes it just has to happen. But a lot of times that's not the situation. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Uh, these tests are extremely difficult. They are extremely difficult um, depending on what their grade level is, especially some of your grade levels as you move up. Um, especially, um, I know Ms. Lauren mentioned she was talking about making improvements with intervention students. Um, a lot of times you get standards gaps that are in there forever because you think about it like you were looking at one grade level, I don't remember which there that you said was, was pretty low in one grade level. So let's say it was fourth grade math. Well, they're That's going right. into fifth grade math and they're going to have gaps there, right? Well, then they're going to go into sixth grade math and they're going to have gaps in seventh grade. So as you move on up, these kids continue to have gaps. And again, you can have a teacher there that is closing those gaps. But remember, what you're looking at is proficiency. Did they pass the test? And the passing level is about a B right now with what our state has, state has said. It's not D level passing. It's a B. <laughs> In order to be considered mastered in that subject, it's a B level. So you've got a lot of kids who have mastered parts of those subjects, and these two are teachers that can probably uh, tell you the same thing. You will look at that data and see that there are kids that have mastered a lot of those parts, but they simply didn't master enough. And because, again, your grading students are only looking at proficiency at about a B level. It's 
about an 86 or above, which is pretty stiff when you see some of these tests. I got just one more question. Is our special ed grades in? With Absolutely, they're okay. all included. All included. So you know that one percent that we can test yeah. that need to be tested on an alternate model that we can't that have to be reassigned. They're all right there. Well, the key to that somehow, I guess, if you get into the fine arts of it, you can. Because I'm looking down. Let's just say Birchfield got a sixth and eighth grade. Well, they could have 20 students there. They could have, let's say, four or five special eds sure. in there. It, I mean, I'm not being mean here, but sure. I'm, I'm just telling you, you've got 20 students, you've got four of them, you're talking 20-something percent of that class. It's hard to make a decision on what you need to it do is. in that room unless you know that. And your teachers have to know their students as well. Sometimes so, we may not. I, I know, I, well, I guess what I'm saying, sometimes these things are not necessarily fair. Is what I'm trying, I'm not being mean, I'm just telling you, what? you got to look at everything in right. there. And, and remember also, this is a test uh, that these kids were not trained to take. Uh, not only were they not trained to take, but these aren't the standards that they were brought up with. So, for example, um, I know you all have heard me say this before at the high school level. We had a group of seniors that graduated two years ago that went through four different assessment and standard models. By the time in their 12 years of school, they went through four different changes. It's massive, and, and anybody who's been a teacher in the classroom can tell you that when they change those standards and those assessment models, you can be teaching your rear off and doing everything you can, and when they change the game on you, it, it can really, the numbers can come out a little bit differently. It doesn't mean you're not doing your job. It doesn't mean you're not working very hard. It doesn't mean your kids don't know anything. It simply means that they've changed the way that they measure that at the end, and that can have some big effects. So you've got some kids that have got some gaps in those standards that have changed over the years. And as you see them take this same model uh, more, and if they keep it consistent, you will see those improvements happen. It's just going to take a little bit of time. And keep in mind, too, that if you look at this, this is on track master slash master. On track is definitely proficient. Master is like advanced. Mm -hmm. We had so, so, so many students that were at approaching. Yeah. And that may mean they only missed one more yeah. question mm -hmm. than they needed to miss. And that is one thing I think it would help if we look at their scores and we figured out, you know, who came so, so close sure. to mastering that, that, you know, just missed it a point or two. And this last, this last year, we hadn't had a test the previous year. Our practice test, to give teachers any kind of idea of what to expect, the practice test was based on the old test, mm -hmm. yes. not the new standard, yeah. not the new test. So it is kind of, in one sense, a little bit unfair. And we needed this year to get for our teachers to get some kind of idea of what to expect. Sure. Is our math test, are they more reading problems? Oh, yes. yes. They're multi -step. Well, Then Obviously, then we have to look back for our reading right. scores are, because if you've got a slow reader in there and you've got a time level, and they and have to read that thing three or yeah. four times just to get where they're getting ready to start, you know they're right. going to run out of time. And honestly, I think the fact that we had our uh, ELA, our intervention, reading intervention that we used the majority of the year last year, so far this year, math we are just <coughs> now getting to order. They, math intervention has now been ordered. We've not been able to use it. They weren't able to use it last year and it's just been a funding thing. So I really think the math intervention is going to be a help with the RTI. Because we've, you know, we've got several students who qualify for RTI, and that's what we need to do is bring them up. And it's it's been working with the reading. So you're telling me that like we held off on the math stuff because of funding? Well, you know, the budget had to be approved through the federal. We've got RTI math. We just have one, having using being able to have one, one centralized one program. They have math intervention at each school, but they're using different materials and, and, and teacher um, created materials and teacher pulled materials. So they've got math intervention. But what we found with the reading a couple of years ago, we went back and did one 
a scripted scripted program, program through that that everybody even, we saw more improvements right, that even there. a teacher assistant yeah. could administer across the board a scripted program that told that interventionist exactly what they were supposed to do what they were supposed to say what the students were supposed to do that's what we have not been able to get in math until that budget was approved and now it finally has been and we spoke amanda we've we've talked to different people and different people so it just took that long and it's shamed in your head but that has been organized so but we are certainly going to look at this and and work for improvement i bet you think i'm full of questions don't you that's not just pouring <laughs> no, off. No, I, I, I'm just concerned about it. And I, and well, I know, I'm blaming we are too. And, and I know that everybody's working hard, and that it just, uh, I, I'm not saying nobody's not working hard because, believe me, I, I know it's teaching's not an easy job. In defense also of the teachers, I think now the way that they're expected to teach is almost unrealistic. Mm -hmm. You know, to subtract in second grade, the problem of 14 from 24 takes eight lines. Mm -hmm. You can only solve six problems on one sheet of paper. Mm -hmm. And you're sitting there, how can that be? How can that be? But this is state requirements. Yes. Yeah. The process. We're yeah, everyone. Process. Whether if a child can learn that 14 from 24 is 10, they ought to be able to write it down. But it's not that it's way. Not it's not that way. We're putting a lot of <laughs> the state puts a lot of extra pressure that's not really necessary on the teachers. It sounds like students. it appears they're just making it complicated. I'm not yeah. being mean here. It sounds like a lawyer, John. <laughs> well, I was going to say they can make I'm things complicated. To, I'm having to relearn second grade math. I did. In a way that I did. I bet. I bet I can hand through. the sheet out right now. I just learned about two weeks ago, mm -hmm. and I, I'm not sure that other than John to do the second grade math. The way that it has to be done. Yeah. See, no longer is it good enough to know the right answer. Right. Okay. You have to know how you. Got you it. have to show mm -hmm. the process. Eight lines. And think about how some kids think differently than other students. Mm -hmm. You know, some can get the right answer in in a in a flash, mm -hmm. and it's much much harder for them sometimes to show exactly and vice versa. Some some kids have no. So it's changed. It's changed it's a lot. Has changed. It's I felt, I, mean, I, I felt that out also when I was helping on the vision. I was getting the right answer. I knew I had the right answer. But my son kept saying, that's not right. And I'm like, well, you need to bring your teacher in here. Because <laughs> 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 it is right. And he's that's like, no, it's right. not right. Because I'm missing all these steps. Mm -hmm. It's stupidity is what it is. And that's what they have to deal with. Yeah. yeah. And the goal, the, the state did that, especially on the math standards. The math is the one you hear a lot about. Mm -hmm. um, remember years back when we went to Common Core, mm -hmm. remember, and then all the, mm -hmm. you know, oh, everybody then was against Common Core, so Tennessee went away from Common Core. Well, they didn't really go away from Common Core. What they did is they peeled the Common Core sticker off of it and they put a Tennessee State yes. Standard sticker mm -hmm. on it, but the standards were exactly the same. Right. And they stuck with those for a couple of years and then they went back and revised the standards again. And all they did is go in there and do some fancy working with words and, and um, application. But as far as the actual curriculum and what you have to learn at each grade level and actual content, they left that there. Um, and, and like I said, these two ladies can probably tell you a lot more in detail about their subject areas than I can, but um, especially at the high school level, I know, for example, our Algebra 2 standards, um, we have those matched up, and I have a couple of math teachers that teach at Roan State part-time um, afterward, and um, there are things that they are doing in Algebra 2 that they don't even do in college statistics and college algebra. But we are requiring every student in the state of Tennessee to be able to master. And they're being tested on that in Algebra 2. And they're not even seeing it at the college level. And that is a national push. That is a national curriculum push. But Tennessee's bought into it. And so that's what we have. It's tough. Okay. There's nothing you can do about it.
Actually, I do have I do have something that I was just joking. I, I gave you guys this paper here. Uh, we completed the third month of uh, of school. The first sixty days. We've actually gone further than that, but I won't put my four on there until it's complete. Uh, you see a modest trend upward in enrollment. Just to give you an idea, we finished last year with 2776. That was our funding number last year. So we're a little over that now. Uh, this past month we're at 2801. Uh, and hopefully that trend will continue. We'll gain a few more students, but it looks like if things stay the way they're going now, we will be funded a little more next year than we than we were this year. Um, and that's all I have. Other than Coach Hall, I have talked about this many times. The things that you guys were talking about earlier is we're never going to be able we're never going to be allowed to succeed. It, it's just not going to happen. And it's not just us. It's everybody. You know, as soon as one system reaches a benchmark, they raise that benchmark. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter, they're not going to wait on 95 counties to reach that benchmark, they're just going to move another one up. And and that's my, been my theory for 20 years in education is, is it's always, you're always running after the carrot. You know, and, and, and for whatever reason that is, I think money I has a lot to do. It's all about the It's all about money. And, uh, and I think we're always going to fight this battle. If we're, if, we're, if we're sitting here at this meeting 50 years from now, we're still going to have this same <coughs> conversation because they're not going to change the way they do things. Mm -hmm. I just will say, because I, I teach middle school reading at Winfield, and all that we've heard is, you know, or the biggest thing that I focused on my kids on was you have to, you can't just put an answer now, you have to tell why you think it. You have to cite text evidence, text yes. evidence, text evidence. So we worked two, I worked two hard years teaching my kid text evidence, text evidence, and then Miss Stanley came and said, well, they said you guys did a great job of citing text evidence, but now you got it, you didn't, they cited correct text evidence, but they didn't pick the best text evidence. So it, the, it's, always, the two, it's yeah. always something like that, you know, they did a great job, they really improved on citing text evidence, now you need to go tell them to cite the best text evidence. And I thought, well... I'm just proud that they got that far, yeah. you know, so we did that great, but then it's always <coughs> something that you didn't pick the best one. Mm -hmm. Even though their text evidence supported their answer, whoever wrote this test and designed it thought, well, this was the better one, and their mind is all objective to me. But. Testing has always been such iron. I remember when they first came out uh, several years ago with the TCAP, and uh, and at that time, the teachers could look at the test as a child was taking the test. And uh, for example, our textbooks that we had, our English textbooks at that time, taught his as a processive pronoun. Well, a question came up on the test, and a processive uh, pronoun was not a possibility because, you know, it can be an adjective, it modifies the noun. And there were different questions like that that the teachers found that. Our textbooks didn't teach them the right way, and so we wrote them down and sent them into the state. And how they fixed that was, teachers were no longer no, allowed to look at the test. Yeah, that is a breach. That, that is. It's true. Yeah. yeah, it became a breach the next year. And there was just all kinds of things like that that we found in our building. Sure. That the teachers reported. Yeah. Ms. Paul Rich, you've been real fun. You got anything? I'm just thinking, welcome to the world of education. Yeah. <laughs> uh, been in 35 years, it was there then. It'll be there 10 years, as Mr. Burley said, 50 years down the road. But uh, unfortunately, that's just the way it is. Um, I do have some good news. Dishwasher is complete. The dish room has got high school. So the ladies are in there. They're happy, and uh, everything is working well with that. Um, I've also sent the request to the state asking approval to uh, do the renovations to the Birchville and Robbins cafeteria, but so far I haven't heard a word back. Sometimes they're a little slow getting back with us on that, but hopefully there won't be any issues. Um, also, you all should find in your packet, I turned into Ms. Sharon Sexton last week, uh, a contract with Hobart. 
Uh, it's time in January to renew the Hobart contract for the dishwashers. And if you, you will notice on here, the Scott Highs has been removed because we do have an 18-month warranty with this uh, dishwasher. So the, the cost is, is less, uh, about $2,000 less in monies. So that will be a good thing, and I would, you know, would like to have that done. Uh, other than that, we're, uh, we're doing fine and feeding our children. And the Friday before um, <coughs> we get out for fall break, or excuse me, Christmas break, we will have our holiday meal in the schools. If some of you I know like to come out, that will be there then. Um, that's really about all I have, unless you all have a question for me. Now, has all of our captures been updated now, or you worked on the last ones? As in updating what? What you've done, you know, where you went in and changed them. And, or you mean the, 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 the remodeling? Yeah. I've got Birchville and I've got Robbins. I've had them designed and everything, but uh, and you all have passed for me to do that. But I've got to get approval from the State Department to also to I can spend that money on that. But I'm waiting on that. And so basically like two. Right, and I've contacted uh, Palmer Hamilton, who would be doing the projects. They're they're in line. They're waiting, ready to go, just as soon as I can get that approval. And I do want to mention one thing. Uh, you had the energy people in here speaking earlier. Only thing I ask, if you all ever do that again, please don't let them take my equipment out. I, that last one, they took equipment out of a couple of my schools and put in yep. stuff that I couldn't even cook with. Yep. Uh, it was it was bad, and I didn't even have any idea they were taking it out. And they took my good steamers out and things, and replaced it with stuff that um, we couldn't even fix corn. But Scott High, we had three lunches, and barely we couldn't even get it done for the first line, and then never could feed the other two lines because you couldn't get the food done. And the same thing happened at Birchville School, and it's like I had one more. I don't remember a period of time. <laughs> But I have replaced the other one. I know Scott High still has their steamer. I'm hoping to do something different with that one. But, I, you know, it may sound good, but if it doesn't do what you need and you've got to feed people fast, you can't have something that takes all day. It may save you energy by the end of the day, but we don't have the end of the day to feed kids. And we got to have it ready and prepared. So uh, there's just remember that with me when you're going through that because, you know, we spend too much to put equipment in there to do the things that we need to do projects that, you know, whatever, no matter what department, whatever their project is, and mine's to feed kids. And uh, we have to have that equipment that's going to produce it and do it quickly because we only have a short window to feed these kids. So that's just something to put some thought into, too. I mean, you know, it sounds good. It'll save you in the long run. Well, definitely saved them with ours because we couldn't use it. <laughs> so you did save money on that piece. So. But, uh, but that's all I have, unless y'all have something for me. That's good to know. Well, I mean, you know, I can just talk from experience and, you know, and right now that one is still at the high school. You got the, Well, they even brought in the, they kept telling me they could do it, so they brought in the manufacturers, people that were going to show us how to do it. So we just, I just made sure we had other stuff to serve. I just sat back and let them do it. Well, they never done it either. <laughs> so um, it wasn't possible to do what we had to do. In that, in that length of time, but those are things that you live and learn, you know, then you know, but, but just remember us when you're doing that. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Paulette. Greg, do you have anything? To kind of add on to what she said, what they did to us was they went through and took all of our surge strips from all the computer labs, mm -hmm. all the classrooms, and replaced them with energy saving strips. And basically what they did was is they had one plug on the end that if a device was turned on, it would work fine. But when that one device was turned off, everything hooked up to that surge strip would turn off. So you'd be in a computer lab, and the kid would be here on station number one, just working away, and they get done and say turn the computer off, and the next five beside it shut down with it. That was energy saving. It took us years to undo all that because they swapped them out and took our old strips with them. So 
uh, yeah, uh, we, we need to be careful about kind of that, uh, you know, bait and switch type thing when we talk about energy efficiency. Um, in other news, uh, uh, Melissa said the testing was going well at Scott High. That is all online. So um, that lab out there, the Mega Lab, has some of the newest and some of the oldest computers in the district in it. And they all seem to do well. They're testing, you know, 90 to 100 kids at a time in that room. Yeah. So that, to me, is a good indicator of what we'll see at the elementaries when we start testing there in a couple of months. So um, with, that, with that budget amendment that you all approved last meeting, we have uh, purchased and obtained the, the new network switches and gear. About a quarter million dollars on that. That has come in. We are getting ready to order another 150 computers that will swap out four or five labs. So that kind of freed up a log jam for us, and we really appreciate it. But uh, Are we able, like when you redo them, are we able to sell our old computers to get anything, or most time they're just nobody wants them? When we take them... When we take them out of the computer labs, the, the, our fleet cycle plan is that we only replace new computers in computer labs. Use them in there for three to four years, take them out, put them in classrooms, administrative stations, whatnot. That's the only way that we can guarantee that the best machines are used by the most kids. Um, at that point, the computer's six, seven, eight years old, you know, ten years old, we just go out some. Uh, they are kind of end of life. What we're finding is, for, for the past couple years, I've been able to get these recycling companies to take all of our stuff, but it's a wash because they want to charge us for monitors and printers and things of that nature. So they want the good stuff, but they want to charge us for the bad stuff. And I've been able to you know, hold them off on that, but that, that ship has now sailed. So now it's to a point of, if I'm going to get rid of all this surplus, you might have to pay somebody to take it. Um, if we had somebody that was really clever, that had a lot of time to dedicate to parting all of these things out and posting them in individual pallets on eBay and boxing them and shipping them and dealing with all that stuff. Could you make some money or at least pay for that person's salary? Are you trying to tell me know. you don't have time to do I, that? You know, I'm just, uh, I, I think I might have a Monday two, two years from now. But yeah, and what, what we find is that technology just moves so quick and, you know, people just went out and bought the new iPhone 10 for $1,000. $1,000 for a phone. A few years ago, that was unheard of. Now it's, it's commonplace. And so you take a, a desktop PC that's 10 years old, and it's slow, and that's the number one thing that they, they pick, whether or not it's slow, nobody wants it. So, so we try to, we, we get as much out of them as we can, and by the time we do, we, you know, it might be best if we sell them for scrap metal. That yeah. might actually, you know, Come out cheap, Bronner's right? is close up there, so that might actually be <laughs> convenient, you know. But, uh, so, but that's all I've got. Okay, thank you, Greg. Okay, John. Well, so for last. well, thank you. I'm not sure about that, but uh, I. I don't know if I understood what you asked Mr. Hall correctly or not, but I did not ask these folks in here. Uh, they just came and it kind of seemed in my area of expertise, so I worked with them. I've tried to understand what they do, and I think I, I, think I have a, a decent grasp of it. I've worked very briefly doing that once upon a time. And John's right in that where you receive a a lot of your savings is from energy that can be controlled. You know, for example, water fountains. You can control them where they only cool a certain period of time out of every hour. But just because you can control it doesn't mean you should control it. And it results sometimes in great inconveniences for the people whose life is designed to help. 
you know, it's just like the one of the one of the issues that I find is like with the air conditioners in the classroom. We still have air conditioners that are monitored by a motion detector. And so when the students are outside for a length of time, that room heats up. It just had marginal capacity to start with. And so once it gets behind, that room doesn't really get cool then and maybe till the next morning. Or Do we not have the capabilities of setting that motion detector? I see a lot of things like that. You can set them to one hour, 30 minutes. I don't minutes think so. For it. In, in those particular ones that they did, I don't think so. They did something with it the just motion detector. Has, it has an in-house thing in it yeah, after yeah. so long. It's like now, a, now the it's units like a 15 could, minute. Right. The units you could set, of course, for the program temperatures, but somehow that motion detector would override them. And so they'll get behind, especially in the middle of the summer months, and they'll just never catch back up. I know one thing I personally think we need to do, I think all of our electric bills, gas bills, whether hoot bills or yours, they need to come across your desk that your eyes see them. Well, I'm just telling you, you, you know, that's the only way you, and, you'll and know that happy. something's going on. Here, here, here's the thing about that, Mr. Thompson. And when you, when you hear me say Mr. Thompson instead of John, you know, I'm getting ready to ask for something. But like you told Greg, I'll have to have some help because I don't have time to do that. But yes, I would love to, to see some things like that. They talked about capital outlay and capital improvement. Uh, I, had, I had a conversation with a lady today who's trying to sell us a, a service to, to monitor our maintenance requests. And one of the things, and we've done pretty well, you know, but all our, fact, all our maintenance requests come in on facts. So that's kind of dependent on somebody checking that facts and seeing, you know, that, oh, we got heat out here and here and here. Now, if it's something critical, They'll, they'll bypass me and they'll call Mike. Or sometimes they call me and I call Mike. You know, 6.30 this morning, uh, uh, Freezer was out, I think, at Scott High, if I'm not mistaken. You know, so they, they immediately call Mike and, and we start working on it. But one of the things that, that I wish we could do at some point is get to where, you know, this lady had a really neat term for it, but instead of just running things till they quit and they just up and die, you, you like a fleet cycle, like Greg talks about, you start replacing them early. And you know that you're going to get seven to ten years out of this kind of uh, air conditioner when they start failing. Instead of fixing them, replace them. We've done that on a limited basis. But, you know, it's just one of those things that just takes more time than I have to devote to it. You know, you've got roofs, you've got heat and air, uh, you've got drainage, you've got plumbing, you know, you've got sometimes an odd project that comes along that, you, that takes more time, like, you know, like the, the drainage over here at Huntsville or different things like that. So it's just something that's going to take a little more time and a little more personnel and probably and some more money. But I, I'd love to be able to do something like that. And Mr. Kyle actually mentioned to me today, I believe it was, that we might get together and be planning on a kind of a, a cycle of taking inventory of where we're at, what we have, and then seeing about replacing like equipment, things like that. But as far as, the only thing I have for the board is a piece of information and we will do whatever the board tells us to do on this but you all have already approved several different textbook adoption committees and going through the paperwork of that i discovered that a few people had been put on that committee that did not have the requisite years of experience you have to have three years experience according to the state to serve on a textbook adoption committee so You've already, already taken action to, to nominate these people. We can either leave them on and let them serve as non-voting members, and that's just something that Mr. Hall and I have talked about, or we could replace them with 
people who do have the, the amount of years. Now, I'm not, uh, all I can see is Tennessee experience. There may, it may not be, there may not be as many as, you know, there may not be very many, but there's probably one or two. Uh, my personal feeling would like to leave them on and have the non voting community members. And that way, the more when they're ready, they get the experience. So, you know, with the adoption cycle. So, if y'all agree with that, uh, that's why I should. I agree, because and those principles are put on, re recommended the one they felt like would be the one to do a good job with it. Mm -hmm. It would be the simplest way to do it. I, and I am not opposed to that at all, but, you know, I feel like anything that I do in my official capacity reflects back on this school board. So if it was ever said, you know, these people were not, shouldn't have been on that committee, then everybody knows. Mm -hmm. But it's not very many. No, not very many. And I agree, I agree with your reasoning. I'm not saying, I, you know, there's nobody on the committee that I would not mm -hmm. want myself. I forgot to mention too the calendar committee is. I got you. I got you. I got you. Okay. <laughs> I got you. I got you. I got you. So I think that's all I have. Okay. You let y'all have any questions for me? Okay. Only thing I want to know about is the trucks. Uh, what is this deal on the trucks that we? Just we get them orders. Got to do a budget amendment. I mean, we talked about. As a matter of fact, Mr. Buckner and I talked about it today. Then it gets back. We do an amendment and just get them ordered. So. Yeah. Okay. Cause it looks. You know, I know those guys are uncomfortable riding in a truck. Three big, big men yeah. in the cab of the truck. Yeah, and, and the and trucks look like they're just about half. They just yeah, and and <laughs> <laughs> they, they they let me know in subtle ways. Like the other day, they invited us. Well, you could go with us, but we don't have room for you. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Translation was, we need our trucks, yeah. <laughs> and they Mr. Do. Hall and I have talked about it, and, and I think it's just a matter of getting the budget amendment, and then we can order them. All right, Mr. Hall. Thank you. Uh, for the agenda, we'd like to approve the board policies as recommended by TSBA. Uh, the first reading, policy number 4.211, work-based learning program, and policy 4.605, graduation requirements. Second reading. Policy number 6.4081, safe relocation of students. I uh, would also like to approve Ms. Linda's uh, calendar committee. I uh, would like to, uh, Ms. Amanda has on, I know she sent y'all something on an email. She did. The, the general purpose amendment number three. Mm -hmm. uh, also would like to approve the contract for the Appalachian Service Project Agreement between Winfield Schools. I also renew the contract with Hobart Sales and Service. I want like to approve the trip for the school board to Nashville for the day on the hill. Uh, just a couple of reminders. I know we've been here a while, guys. Uh, school dismiss on December the 19th at 10 a.m. We will be running buses on that day. Uh, so let's see if buses will leave Scott High School at 10 a.m. <coughs> Reminder to the board, TSBA day on the hill, February 12th and 13th. Uh, as soon as I got everyone's information, I called. We were unable to secure a uh, reservation at the Double Tree Inn, but we are at the, the Home of Suites, uh, where, we only, where we have stayed before. And also, a reminder everyone that over the Christmas break, the central office here will be closed December 20th to the 26th. And that's all I have, unless y'all have any questions for me. I would like to, to announce to the board that as soon as we adjourn, that uh, we'd like to meet with Mr. Beatty in executive session. I'm just very thankful that Miss Diane wasn't really hurt in her accident that she's here with us and all one face. Did you bring that one? No. Thanks, Diane. You have everything, John? Yeah. John? I asked all my questions long ago. <laughs> You can't ask anymore. Yeah, you're, you're <laughs> so y'all got me cut off. Me and Linda's the same hole. <laughs> All right, with that, we can proceed with you.